Hello, I'm Ann Gritch, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this segment of the Oral History of the Diocese of San Jose. And with me today is Father John Pedigo. Father John has quite a, an impressive title. He's with Catholic Charities, but he is the Director of Advocacy and Community Engagement. Is that correct? <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> so I have also known Father John since he was a seminarian. So welcome. It's <laughs> Thank good you. to have you here. Thank you, Ian. <laughs> So can we begin by just telling us a little bit about your background, where you grew up, your education? Sure, I, I grew up in Pacifica. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Mother was Buddhist, uh -huh. dad was kind of a Baptist, Southern Baptist. Uh -huh. and so when you put the two together, you get a Catholic. Got it. And, and a Roman Catholic. <laughs> a Roman Catholic. And a priest, a Roman Catholic <laughs> priest. So I uh, grew up in Pacifica, uh, public school. Um, started just, I started um, a university at San Francisco State mm. uh, with political science. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the School of Creative Arts had far better parties, ah. and um, <laughs> so I switched to a more fun major with more fun people. Got it. And uh, so, uh, but I've always kept kept my uh, f my finger in um, in political science. Mm -hmm. So I've done that. You know, I didn't want to spend another year at home to get a double degree, so gotcha. I went off to grad school in, in Indiana University for music, ah. and uh, with a master's in performance there. Started a doctorate there. Uh, but at the same time, I was bit by the bug. The of, vocation of bug? Vocation, the vocation bug. It's a bug. <clears throat> it is a bug. It's a giant, giant cockroach or whatever you <laughs> want to call it. It's a giant bug that bit me and um, <clears throat> was real. And, and I was um, discerning with um, <clears throat> the, uh, you know, wanting to do parish ministry. Mm -hmm. uh, Father Borchermeyer at, at St. Charles Borromeo and in, in Indiana University. And then um, oh, my spiritual director <clears throat> was down in St. Mine Reds. Oh, yes. And uh, Jeremy King. <clears throat> and I had a really, uh, really very uh, incredibly great community because I went through the RCIA uh -huh. <clears throat> and uh, early on. Which was fairly new. It was new. It was one, actually one of the first parishes in the in the wind Midwest to to have it. It's had a full RCI team, scrutinies, the whole thing. And I also belonged to a small uh, Christian community, mm -hmm. uh, which was really part of my discernment process through the whole through the whole thing of of uh, being a catechumen um, and all the way through um, through uh, mystagogia. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was. I really had like the textbook perfect uh, experience of. Uh, uh, of the um, RCIA, of initiation, right? Yeah. And one of the um, um, one of the big proponents of uh, ordination of women, I can't, I think it's Mary something or other, but she was at you know, Indiana University, and the 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 uh, the pastoral vicar uh, before he left to get married, he was um, he was um, a, a scripture scholar, mm. and he went went back uh, <clears throat> to the West Coast to uh, to to teach at university. So we had some really great um, progressive uh, mm -hmm. thinkers that were part of that process. And while, while I was in Pacifica, <clears throat> I was at St. Peter's. Ah, yes. Father Durier, I don't know if you remember yes, Father Durier. Yes, Robert Durier. <clears throat> right, so he had the kids, right, right. the family. And um, all, everybody in the neighborhood was Catholic. Uh -huh. And I want to be Catholic because- yes, everybody else is. Because everyone else was. And Mrs. Nolte up the street, mm -hmm. Uh, for would give the <laughs> the ki the kids that went to school uh, the, the catechism they call it CCD in those days mm -hmm. uh, popsicles and I told my mom I want to go to the catechism why do you want to go to catechism well because they get popsicles <laughs> <laughs> whatever it takes <laughs> whatever it takes well I did not go to catechism but but um, <clears throat> but all through uh, high school I had friends that were in the youth group and did a lot of kind of stuff so my experience of Catholicism was very much grounded in. A community mm -hmm. um, grounded in critical thought, mm -hmm. um, kind of progressive liturgies. I met uh, Father, um, he did the music, uh, uh, Sulpician. Father John Durier? Fa no, Father no, no, no. John Olivier. Olivier. John Olivier. I played music for John Olivier when I was in fifth grade all the way through high oh, school. Oh, wow. So I got to know Father um, Olivier for years, you know, before, and he was very nice, very funny. Um, uh, I mean, because we were little kids, so as we got older, he became less funny. But he was, because he demanded a lot more. He was oh, a great yes. guy. Um, but after, actually, after ordination, he was really happy to see I continue with music, and he and I did a, a couple of concerts together uh -huh. up, up at St. Uh, St. Albert's. I uh, did a recital. Yes. But um, <clears throat> Father Deary was a, 
you know, early on, you know, exposed that parish mm -hmm. to a proper liturgy in terms of the people's participation. And um, so that kind of grounded me as, as being a Catholic first mm -hmm. um, in critical thought, in the best of Catholicism. And so that was my experience of Catholicism. I think that just really was a grounding influence for me uh, you know, for going later on to, life, for I'm later sure. life. I, and, and in fact, it's really funny. What people ask me, what do I remember about my ordination? I went to St. Patrick's, you know, like everybody else. And I said, I, you know, I really remember my baptism more than anything else. Well, I remember your ordination because I was involved in it. <laughs> you were. <laughs> did you remember our knee pads that we used? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we just did that marble was so hard. Yes, because you're group was the first ones to be ordained at St. Joseph Cathedral, yes, and, and that marble doesn't give. No, <laughs> and we had a really wide variety of people oh, in our ordination class. Did. We had, um, you know, Kiefer, uh, Father Kiefer, um, you know, God rest his soul, and then all the way to me, so we did both ends of the spectrum. That's they right. had folks in the middle, folks oh, in yeah, the extreme it was great. ends. It was great. Yeah, it was a great experience. <laughs> So you were at St. Patrick's. Now, how did you come to choose San Jose as opposed to the Archdiocese? <laughs> You'll probably edit all these things out, but I'll tell you anyway. <laughs> it'll be in the hard copy, as it were. Um, so I originally was for the Archdiocese of San Francisco because mm -hmm. it was Pacifica. Mm -hmm. And while I was in the seminary, um, I had come. Uh, we were at that point. It was at we were in the uh, St. Joseph's for discernment year because mm -hmm. I didn't have any philosophy uh -huh. and I had no theology. And um, when I first went in, they, you know, um, the arch, the archdiocese, um, you, you know, so, you know, we need to do that discernment. Of course, we want to do discernment year. And I really, I said, I looked at the whole process as discernment. I, I looked at the seminary as discernment. Well, it it's is. not preparing to me go in. You know, you you go through the motions to get ordained. That was not my goal, and it really wasn't. I mean, I would say the last year was different than the previous well, sure. four. But for me, it was really discerning. Is this really want to do? And so, um, I was. Re I entered into. Um, St. Joseph's uh, with that as a perspective. I remember it was like a 95, 96 degree, it was hot, 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 hot. And the first day I got there and, and like everybody else, cause never been into Catholic school, never went to seminary. So I'm, I come down on my, you know, I grew up on the coast and when it's anything above 70, you wear shorts. So I'm just wearing shorts and you know, flip flops and a t-shirt and they go, uh, the, the priest, one of the priest Father Strange goes, you're wearing shorts. And I go, yeah. And he repeated it three times, you're wearing shorts. I'm thinking, well, yes, I am wearing shorts. You're not supposed to wear shorts. And instead of saying, oh yes, Father, let me change, my response was, why? <laughs> why? And again, that, that was, was my, the first clue. <laughs> that was the first clue that I, maybe, maybe something's not a great match here, but that set me up. And I use that story as a way to kind of frame my experience of priesthood mm -hmm. and my my interaction with the institutional church mm -hmm. and it allowed me to have friendship with this one older guy this old priest guy at St. Joseph's where I met him was Monsignor Boyle oh, because yes. he thought the question of why was a great question because I tell that story all the time so now you can't edit it out I, but we but wouldn't dream of it. we would dream of it but it was like why it didn't make sense so Father Boyle you know um kind of he kind of hovered around, you know, uh, got to know the guys and he gave talks and he gave this amazing talk about social justice. Well, my dad uh, in his early years was an organizer, union organizer. Ah. Uh, both parents, strong progressives. Mm -hmm. um, we were raised in a household that, you know, exposed us to different cultures and races. And, we, and growing up, we had Thanksgiving dinner with African-American family, you know, and families, a bunch of families. Mm -hmm. That was how what we did for Thanksgiving. So. I never knew what it was like to not be multicultural, mm -hmm. to not have these things. So when Father Boyle uh, saw us at a, at a talk and it would raise questions, he was impressed that you know, there are people that are actually interested in this. Mm -hmm. um, we talked, it, I think I shared the story about the, the wearing the shorts and why, when does it doesn't make any sense and trying to have a debate about what to wear when, when it was utterly ridiculous because the sisters would get offended. This is what it came down to. It says, oh my God, if they're <laughs> offended by that. You know, and I went up and I changed because I had already had grad school and I was an older student um, in discernment. Mm -hmm. So um, Monsieur Boyle said, um, well, I'm going to be giving a talk down in Gilroy ah. on Cesar Chavez. And then um, he t talked a little bit about this and said, why don't you guys come down? So, of course, I went down with my friend Miguel Seja and a bunch of other kind of real kind of progressive leaning seminarians to hear this talk. Mm -hmm. Well, while at St. Joseph's, you're not allowed to drink anything. You can't drink any beer. And even all of us are all over 21. You mm -hmm. don't do beer, you don't, 
You just don't do that. So we get to the parish, and they're offering us beer. Cerveza. Cerveza. And, it was, and we, we had a nice, good Mexican meal before mm -hmm. the talk. He was going to give a talk at 7, and we got there like 5.30 or so. And we're, we hadn't drunk, none of us had drink, drunk beer for like months at a time until we went down there. We had a couple <laughs> beers, right? So we were there, and, and um, he said, Monsieur Boyle's kind of enjoying the meal with us. And afterwards, uh, they said, would well, you guys sing some songs? So uh, so that my friends would, you got out the guitars and sing Mexican songs, and I didn't know all the, the tunes, but I did wear the Mexican sombrero and the dance. I think, I forget what happened. But Jean, uh, Monsieur Boyle said, that's where he remembers this. I knew that you were going to keep her when you were the crazy seminarian <laughs> wearing the, wearing the, the sombrero, sombrero dancing. <laughs> um, and so that was kind of how um, our friendship began in that kind of goofy way. And um, But since then, we, you know, after that time, we had actually a lot of serious conversations mm -hmm. around the, the issue of justice and, and organizing and, and, and economic concerns of, of people. I'm going to ask you some questions about Father Gene. Um, sadly, he went to God before we had yeah. a chance to begin this, before we began this process. I do have one story to tell you. Father, Father Boyle was in my priest Uncle Jack's class, the class of 46. Yes. I, at the time, was two years old when he was ordained at St. Mary's Cathedral. And of course, that class had about 30, 34. Yeah. And the legend, of course, you know how family legends grow, <laughs> but the legend is that at a very quiet time, all of the fathers were prostrate. And I said in my childish voice, in a voice that carried throughout the building, how come Uncle Jack and his friends are going night-night? Because they were in albs, which was yeah. their nightgowns, as they far are. as I was, mm -hmm. and they were prostrate. Mm -hmm. So at any rate, that... <laughs> Um, but I think I, at one point, I think it was Gene's 60th anniversary, I pointed out that I was the only person in the room who had been at his ordination besides mm. himself. <laughs> oh, gosh. So tell us just, we know mm. how you guys met. Did you sort of follow him in terms of being aware of the different aspects of his life as he went on you, in San Francisco, the Board of Supervisors, all of oh, that? Oh, my God. So Gene Boyle, through the course of my seminary, so there's a couple pivotal figures for me. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, one was Gene Boyle, who I met around social act, and the other was um, Frank Norris, who provided, and who was another good friend of yours. Mm -hmm. So Frank, uh, the late Frank Norris, um, of Felicia's memory, uh, an amazing mentor to me and, and was truly um, my rock when I was at at, at, in the seminary and dealing with all this stuff and mm -hmm. trying to put together my ethical concerns that I learned early from Gene and he kind of poisoned me as it were, poisoned the, 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 the idea. And then going to Norris uh, just sort of cemented all of that in, in a, in a you know, with a kind of a, a really a, a theological grounding. Mm -hmm. Um, Gene was extremely well read in a lot of areas of political theory. To the day he died. To the he day he died. And, and he was... Um, Gene, uh, with Gene, there was, of course, the, the and I have all, all of his books. He gave me his library. Mm -hmm. Really a, a, an impressive array of literature. Obviously, a lot on political theory, a lot on uh, movements, a lot on um, farm worker books, which you really don't have those kinds of books around anymore. They're not even on on um, uh, e iBooks, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, so a lot of that stuff, he did the, the, this thing called a liter Little Kerner uh, 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 Report. Yes, which was really a pivotal place, and he would talk about this. And I, just, I want to kind of say this because it's, it really is one of the more, kind of, um, kind of foundational pieces for the Diocese of San Jose, mm -hmm. is that the little Colonel Colonel report came at a time uh, before the diocese was formed, but it was in the archdiocese, which throughout the country everything was exploding in racial tension everything was exploding in terms of the, the Vietnam War and and the late and, 60s early 70s right well 70s. Th this this what was happening at the time of course it was that it was the collusion between um, established law enforcement and FBI and established political powers to try to suppress and silence the voices of people asking questions, mm -hmm. which is why Gene, I think, was really kind of like why we found uh, this older priest that was this radical guy was because he appreciated the question. The, the little Kerner report was an echo of the Kerner report that took place in, you know, uh, in, in D.C. and na nationwide. Well, the little Kerner report uh, you followed a, a methodology of 
taking existing materials of existing research and putting that together to ask the question, what's going on in San Francisco with uh -huh. race and economics? Uh -huh. What's happening? Let's look at these pieces. And so amazing, brilliant students at that time, because this seminary had, you know, at that time had amazing students, and, and they had put together this, uh, this research that was already there, but the key was the integrative research, which is to take materials that are studies and then put it together in this kind of one source mm -hmm. and then be in dialogue with that source by asking specific hyper-local questions about how is this showing up in San Francisco? Mm -hmm. Because at that time, you know, you had the Western edition was, yes. was, was an absolute, I mean, he was at, you know, Sacred Heart. Art. Exactly. Right, or he called us, they call it Secular Heart, you yeah. know, and, and, and there was all this stuff that was going on. Yep. And the institutional church was not willing to party with those who are, who are the, um, asking questions directly mm -hmm. for the poor. Mm -hmm. and, and what happened at that time, I believe it was McGuckin, was, was, was Archbishop, yes. Archbishop McGuckin was not too enthused mm -hmm. by, by Gene you know, acting as the academic advisor for these students to ask these very difficult questions of the power establishment in San Francisco mm -hmm. to say, is this right? Because at that time, uh, this is pre-Harvey Milk. So there was, there was this kind of structure in the archdiocese, in the archdiocese structure that was very much patterned and modeled in, in, in terms of status quo and keeping things the same as, as, a, as, as the, the, the people elected to the city council. Oh, we left. Were, they were half Irish and half Italian. Right, because it wasn't, it wasn't representative of the neighborhoods. Exactly. Right, and so this is all part of this movement that, that really kind of allowed Harvey Milk and others to raise that question, should we be directly of, you know, of the neighborhoods, mm -hmm. really of the people, rather than of kind of a citywide thing with only people that had access to money and access to campaign nice. funds could get the, you know, and so Gene saw this as structural injustice. Mm -hmm. So he, he was amazing about this, right? So he got the students to do this. Students were called in, raked over the coals. Gene was exiled. Uh, you know, all these kinds of things. And They were and really alive times. Those though. were alive times. And I was like, you know, you really didn't cut your teeth until you got fired by the archbishop <laughs> right. and exiled completely. So me getting, you know, moved out of Guadalupe was nothing in comparison. <laughs> and all the grief that I've had to endure of saying stuff, nothing, nothing. in comparison with, with Boyle. Um, the other thing that, that was really interesting was, um, and I don't know if you guys have this, but the story about, and it's taught me if you do, was when Gene was at Sacred Heart and they had that comic book. No. So, so this is the other thing that was, uh, again, made him a hero to me. <clears throat> while he's asking all these questions, and while the little Kerner report was getting everyone just crazy uh, annoyed, um, uh, the uh, sheriff um, was not too pleased with the pastors and faith leaders in the Western edition, because you're kind of riling up mm -hmm. a population that, that were, was able to be pacified or controlled by just giving them a little bit of here and there and giving people crumbs. Well, Gene knew that was BS. That was just not, you know, not something that you, 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 it was, was okay. <clears throat> so what Boyle did is that he, uh, you know, did a couple things. One is that he said, I need to ask that the kids are hungry. Why are they hungry? Mm -hmm. And so he had invited, uh, or this group approached him and says, you know, you're, our, the kids in the school are hungry. So the school of young, educated uh, African-American men asked Gene, can we feed the kids at school? And he says, yeah, my, the kids are falling asleep in first, in first period. They are asleep and they're no good. They're, there's, there's no food at home. He says, yes, come and feed them because the people need to eat right. because they cannot study. If they can't study, they can't get an education. If they can't get that education that they needed to get the jobs, they're never going to economic advance. So he had this whole change theory, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, of course, of course, come in and feed them. Well, I remember. To, who did these folks, well, they ended up being the Black Panthers. Well, the Black Panthers were not a terrorist organization. No. They were an organization of, of, of African-American men and women who felt that people needed uh, you know, education mm -hmm. and food, uh, you know, community safety, police accountability, all the things that the Black Lives Matter movement is asking for now. Yeah, exactly. And so uh, he gave them, this group of folks, permission to feed uh, oh, the kids, kids, the school kids. Mm -hmm. So what happened is that, of course, you can imagine. they hear about this, you know, the sheriff and the police, so they're really angry. So the FBI 
when Gene was, God knows what he was doing, picketing somewhere going, God knows what he was doing. They go into his, into his rectory and plant um, a subversive comic book, which is, we you know, had violent overtones like such as kill the pigs. Mm -hmm. And then they did a search later than they did a search of what, what the heck happened here. And then they found that this was a, a mm -hmm. comic book. Of course, Gene, if anybody knows Gene Boyle. He would not be reading comic no, books. No, he does not read comic <laughs> books. I mean, it has to be small pick and a lot of footnotes. I mean, exactly. that's, that's Gene's. All, not, I mean, and the sense of humor he has is not comic book no, sense it's of humor. No, not, not a bit. And he is very critical. of. So, so anybody knows, right? So, and I was just a kid at this time. I don't think it was white, white, at 11 or something <laughs> when, when this was going on. So I did not know him at this time. But... Um, he was in the news all the time. Yes, he was. And uh, my parents, I think, talked about that damn priest once. <laughs> my parents were liberal, but they said, oh, what's that damn priest doing? There? <laughs> so anyway, um, uh, anyway, it was proven that this was not you know, the book, but he was already censored by the archbishop, censored by uh, other priests were not talking to him. Um, I think then, then he went to uh, Valambrosa for, you yes, know, he, did. he was in yeah. Valambrosa. You know, Warren Holleran and Tom Madden were good friends. Right, and, he's, and, and he, you know, he yeah. oversaw the, the kind of, um, uh, the, the re, redesign and, 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 and renewal of this particular estate that mm -hmm. became the, um, that became the, the, the center and right. had to do, deal with the water, the septic uh, tank and, and put the rooms in and, and really it was actually a really interesting because he, a lot of uh, retreat houses were, were very dour places mm -hmm. in those days. Yeah. Um, he had a, a different idea about retreat houses should be comfortable at the standard of, of a you know, moderately priced hotel room. Um, they should be places that are not a places of suffering, but but of renewal. Should have their own bathroom. <laughs> you should have your own bathroom, right? Yeah. Uh, things that it's not like a flop house that right. you just go to. So um, he really kind of lifted up that standard of what it mm -hmm. meant to have a retreat house. So he did all these amazing things. Um, you know, people talk about how did he learn to fly and, and this whole <laughs> farm workers thing because he got in the farm worker stuff. And, oh, did he ever? <clears throat> and 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 he learned to fly because you need to get from point A to point B in a very quick. Mm -hmm. uh, the best way is in and the, the air. The only way to do it was in the air. Um, so uh, he took flying lessons, and um, he was a pilot. And eventually, he just did a lot of flying all over the place, and he just loved it. Mm -hmm. You know, to the very end, he just wished he could fly, and then he couldn't anymore. Thank God, because his driving wasn't great at the end. But his flying would have been worse. <laughs> <clears throat> but um, but uh, the other piece that really um, struck me was, again, the, the love uh, of the passion of the farm workers. And that kind of led us to, um, to when we worked together at, at St. Catherine's, mm -hmm. is they pulled him out of retirement. The guy just was like, retired. Uh, and I was at well, St. Catherine's. Well, prior to that, he had <clears throat> been very much involved in the creation of the diocese as far as it... Creation of the diocese. The establishment yeah. of the Office, Office of Inter 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 Interreligious and Public Affairs. And the opening of the cathedral. <clears throat> opening, but before the opening of the cathedral, it was dealing with the Vietnamese. Oh, yes. The Vietnamese um, That's uh, when I issue. came on board. That was huge. Right. And, and what he tried to do, uh, he really tried to help. Uh, of course, he and uh, Jim McEntee. And, I mean, he's a guy that we ought to. You know, Jim McEntee was another kind of partner in crime, as it were felt that dialogue is the most appropriate uh, methodology that one should use in helping, you know, try to uh, resolve some of these, you know, conflicts that seemed, you know, to be going nowhere. And it was an escalation and, and you know, um, it's sort of like, you think the institution would learn from its long history past that staying stuck in your story is not going to get you far with anybody. It's only going to create cynicism or anger or revolution. Um, I, I was, you know, a seminary at the time, so we were kind of blissful, not blissfully, but we were purposely left out of that, yes. out of that, that conflict. <clears throat> Gene, uh, you know, told me post mortem that it was he and McEntee. It was about that dialogue. How do we create dialogue? So that, you know, that was very difficult. He learned that by trying to deal with the farm workers and the landowners. Mm -hmm. That it's that dialogue. But when the landowners, the vineyard owners, were not treating the farm laborers with respect, and and giving them the right to negotiate uh, the conditions of their work, their salaries just these pieces that are fundamental to Catholic social doctrine. Mm -hmm. When they weren't allowing that to happen, of course, Gene got his Irish up and, you know, fought. 
But his belief was that we need to be in the same place. We need to talk together. I mean, that was a really big piece about Gene's stuff. And so, um, you know, I, and, you know uh, that kind of stuff was, you, uh, sadly, it's, it's lost, that he never really had a, there was no systematic telling of Gene's life or his, his experience. Um, I hope that at some point I'll be able to do some writing around this, but I've taken his theories and taken his talks and, mm -hmm. and incorporated them as part of my own, my own work. Um, you know, I like to think that um, because he was preparing me for all my years and early years as a priest and then uh, when I became newly ordained, working with him at St. Catherine's uh, through a very difficult time at St. Catherine's, mm -hmm. um, he was able to um, really get us to think through how do you do social change? And uh, yeah, it is through pickets, it is through some stoppages, it is through a number of kinds of things, but probably the most effective and the, the least costly is, is, is conversation it's and to dialogue, talk. to talk. And it's creating, and, and the, the trick is, do we make space for, for us to listen? Mm -hmm. And do we make space for us to, um, you know, resolve our conflict? And that's kind of what Gene, his big thing was, was, was about that. And, and, and towards the end of his, um, his days, um, his, his attention went to um, a lot of readings in um, eschatology. Ah. So, um, you know, he was really, really uh, concerned about, um, you know, how do we understand the eschatology? I mean, we've had a number of talks, of course, about his own, on which I think is the proper form, but I mean, of his own personal, his personal journey mm -hmm. and his struggles um, as a human person mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and what it meant to be the leader. But I remember asking him because I said, you know, of all these things that went on, you know, why didn't you just leave? Mm -hmm. And it ties into this, his, his belief at the end of, towards the end of his life is returning to this deep faith. And he said, um, you have to make a fundamental choice for Christ and the church. That has to be that first question. And yeah, the, the institution didn't treat him well. It punished him. It, it exiled him. Um, it ignored him. Uh, this, I mean, there, there's a, the funny story was when, uh, when everybody else in his class was being made a Monsignor, he was purposely left off. So his friends, mm -hmm. what they did is they had a giant, you're not a Monsignor party for him, I, that's what I call it, it was a, a giant party where they got together while everyone else is getting the red, you know, the, right. little, the red capes. Mm -hmm. This is back in, I guess, the 70s or something. Right. And, and he didn't get it. And there's a part of him that, you know, was oh, really yeah. bothered by sure. it, you know, because of his age and his generation. Well, that was an acknowledgement. An acknowledgement. Yeah. So he didn't get that. And, and, and he, need, he had, there was a part of him that needed that acknowledgement. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Part that, uh -huh. uh, but <laughs> he didn't get it, but his friends gave him a party. A huge party at a very fancy hotel. I think it was St. Francis or something. Oh, like right. That. Top very, of the line. Top right. of the line. And, um, Anyway, it was uh, he, of course, reveled in that stuff. I, for me, I would find that annoying and embarrassing, but he, he reveled in it all. Um, well, he finally was made a Monsignor. He was made a Monsignor, you're right. He was made a Monsignor towards, you know, towards the end after retirement, of course. Mm -hmm. you know. um, and then he was brought back to work some more. But, um, but I, mean, I think the legacy of, of Gene Boyle is, is not just carried in me. I mean, I obviously have continued to do the work that he has put me in positions and introduced me to a number of people, to the Jewish community, uh, to the interfaith community, to the labor community, to the uh, 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 farm workers community and the movement, um, and and have has guided a lot of my reading in the area of justice and social change, um, just as Norris has had directed me into what to look for um, in terms of um, systematics and, mm -hmm. and foundational theology. Um, uh, Gene's legacy is not in one person; it's in like the movements that he's. Sure started and so um, there's a number of us that that are kind of working with his memory and, and Jim McEntee's memory and we're, we're working uh, real strong we're uh, groups of us are, are really active in the immigrant rights community mm -hmm. um, we're working for um, uh, you know obviously immigration reform back in back in the uh, early uh, 2000s where Gene Boyle was up there and that's right and and all what, the top was of it pickup prop truck 187 it, prop, prop 187 he yeah. gave me free reign to do that, mm -hmm. uh, which is really funny because um, it was where I cut my teeth in organizing. Where uh, there was this thing on um, uh, on the on PBS where they were interviewing me about the about what happened in, in that time, and it was I think it was I I think it was at, at um, 
Gene Boyle just got to St. Catharines because it was October uh, of '94, and um, there was, you know, as, as you, there was a, you know, a lot, lot, lot of transitions, right. right? A lot of transitions, and um, he's just trying to get, you know, liked there. You know, he's not going to, you know, so, so 187 comes up, and they're, uh, it's just the worst thing, and they're going to take away ability for going to school. school. Oh, it was awful. It, it was, it was, but it was anti-immigrant politics had reached where it is right now nationally. It was that way in California. And the GOP was, you know, had thrown their hat in the ring of, to get elected, you, you had to be extremely anti-immigrant. We knew that was not, not, not it was nonsense, but it was also not tenable in the long run. Because everyone's, you know, these young people are all gonna be voters one day, and you keep on doing this, they're never gonna support the GOP. Well, they didn't, mm -hmm. because at 187, it was the, the high point, the zenith of, of the anti-immigrant movement, and Gene Boyle was going to him and says, yeah, this is going on, and he would, of course, you know, little did I know that he's basically stoking the fire. He is throwing kerosene on the fire to get me all riled up. Sure. So he sends me to this damn labor, you and know. You're, you are easily uh, riled, well, rileable. Well, because <laughs> it was Boyle and, and you know, darn, you know, Mor Norris that, that destroyed sure. me. I had no... <laughs> Hardly. No, uh, hardly Ruin, any options. Ruined for life. I was I ruined it. for life. <laughs> and so um, so I get, uh, it was after some kind of a meeting up in, 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 down in San Jose, and it was uh, probably a labor meeting that Gene had me go to, and um, I came back, and I was just really annoyed and very angry and riled up about 187. I come back to the parish, and Gene had already gone to bed, and, or he was either on vacation or gone to bed. It was because it was late. Mm -hmm. And I, I couldn't go bound on his door and, you know, let's go talk about this. <laughs> Yo, so I, I went down, his sister Hesella was there, and, and two other guys, Jose Montemayor and uh, Jose oh, Matilda, oh. were there. And there was th three of them and me, and coming in my broken Spanish that time, and explaining how furious I was and angry and frustrated. And, I'm, and, and uh, you were in the office, I think, at that time, and uh, there was a prayer that was supposed to be scheduled at the cathedral, and no one planned it. And it was like just like three weeks away. No one's advertising it. It was just, there were so many other things going on in the diocese, I guess nothing was done. And I said, we're gonna have a prayer in there for immigrants, and we're gonna go there, and I just wanna check. I'm, we'll just go there, I'm gonna take a cross, and I'm gonna take these people, we should be praying for what's happening to our people. And and there were other people that were, you know, uh, wanting something to be done, so I said, well, we're just gonna take a cross, we're gonna walk up there. Mm -hmm. And anyone wanna come? Well, I'll take 50 people from Morgan Hill walking up to Cathedral and make yeah. a statement. So, uh, do you remember that? we did. <laughs> But it wasn't 50, it was like 200. Uh -huh. And it was hundreds of people. And as we're walking up there, there was more and more people coming up. And that was the first immigrant rights um, movement in, uh, march that really had a critical amount of people yes. in the county mm -hmm. ever. And it started in the, in the Catholic parish, you know, St. Catharines. And then mm -hmm. other parishes and other organizers and other people were calling up, what are you gonna the do? East side. Well, the East yeah. Side, they found out what's happening. So they said, well, just, just, we'll all meet at the cathedral. Right. Okay, great. So they were organizing, they talked to these people organizing. I was, you know, I'm just, with the, I'm the idea guy, no details. Well, little did I know that Jose Montemayor and these guys all knew these people on radio stations are kind of advertising this. I know what the hell's going on, right? So we're right, you know, they're making signs in their backyard, they're making signs after mass. And then, you know, we go up in a rinky dink you know, the broken down hall that St. Catherine's on the corner of Dunn and Monterey. Mm -hmm. we, we got, and we just started marching and we're walking. And uh, one of the most moving things was we uh, were really tired. It was hot, it was October, right? So we arrived at Christ the King. Mm -hmm. Which was a new church. Which is, a, it was a mission still, it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't a parish yet. Ah, okay. And they were still building it. Ah. And it was dust on the floor, and there was everything else. But we got there, and they went, well, we'll give you some water when we get there. We got there, then the bunch of folks from um, Holy Family were there, and they had warm buckets, and they washed our feet. Oh, oh my, oh, quite wonderful. <laughs> it was a uh, the best Holy Thursday experience in October I've had mm -hmm. because we were so hot, tired, tired yeah. and we just sat there, and they. They took care of you. Right, and we were like weary, and we weren't, and we still weren't near downtown, and we're going, we're never gonna make it to the prayer. Mm -hmm. And this time we, we can't jog because there's the old, older people and little sure. kids, and so we're, we're gonna go there together, we'll make it together. And we didn't, I don't think people had cell phones in those days, or we nope. didn't, and so we said, well, just have, well, someone has to drive up and let them know that we're on gonna, our way. On our way, because only really wealthy people had phones, and we didn't have those phones, right? So uh, you know, where we are, and we're letting, 
calling people where we're at. And um, But I just remember sitting there and all these, there were old elderly white ladies that were washing. And I looked over and um, young, hurt, angry uh, uh, Chicano kids mm -hmm. Um, they were hearing so much stuff. They were called terrible names in school yeah. and they were marching for the family, literally for their lives. And, and here are these people who were the white folks that they thought were their enemies were on their knees, taking care of right, washing their yeah. feet. And, um, wow. and I thought, wow, that's what, uh, this is the change is happening. We, we can't undo this. Mm -hmm. And then we got into the um, cathedral, in the, or by the cathedral in the downtown, and there was thousands of people, and we're getting there, then they're coming, rushing towards us, and a bunch of little kids were saying, stay behind the cross, they couldn't stay behind the cross anymore, and they <laughs> ran in front, they're all greeting, and no one knew each other, but they're all yelling and jumping up and down, and everyone's making this huge pathway for us to get into the cathedral. Now, I am so tired of, I don't know, I'm, I'm sure that Gene Boyle did something there. I don't remember what he said or what happened. I was so tired, and I realized, oh my God, none of us made plans for how we're gonna get back to St. Catherine's. Oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> so we had oh, to make an answer, can someone drive us back home? Right. <laughs> so we, we all got rides back, but I remember just being so tired <clears throat> uh, and hoarse, because we're chanting, and, and mm -hmm. we get to the cathedral, and. Um, and I remember walking in, and then uh, Monsignor Brown was up at the choir loft, just glaring in that perfect oh, yeah. way he does. Oh, yes. Him and Rodoni, because I asked Rodoni, he says, hey, is the cathedral still open? Yeah, it's still open. Yeah, they didn't reschedule anything. He says, no, Bishop's not going to be there. He's not going to be there. He says, great, we're going to save one seat. We'll be the unoccupied seat. <laughs> and so everyone, there's every single seat was, was covered. But I said, one seat must remain empty. You know, but it's just, this is not the bishop's cathedral, this is the people's cathedral. Mm. It's, his, it's his chair. But all, and and uh, when we got in there, there was every single seat was taken, all the, all the, um, the, the platform, the dais was covered, everybody sitting, even where the priests would sit, the deacon seats, and up the platform, everyone sitting. You couldn't fit anything else in there. But it was just everyone coming together. And I think at that point we, and, and there was thousands of more outside. Yep. We recognized that there is some power that we didn't realize we had. Uh, and, you know, and I must say that, you know, were it not for someone like Boyle and Norris and, and all these other people that, that, uh, that made the space for this newer generation of people, nothing would get done. But while we were leading up to that march, or really it was mostly after that march, mm -hmm. Gene Boyle, um, you know, um, took a very strong um, position on calling out um, the racism. Mm -hmm. And every Monday he would have in his box, you know, comments and, and, and receive, you know, the AOL.com or the hate, you know, mm -hmm. a hate mail and, and, and emails uh, from people that were complaining about his talk or my talk of that, that particular weekend of whatever we, we preached. And it was just a regular thing. There was just a really, um, just people did not like mm -hmm. the fact that we're talking Making about these issues. Right, but I don't think that was not the intent. I think the, the intent was what space do we create so that we, there can be equity, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that's the struggle that we have today. So the legacy of Gene Boyle and, and anyone doing justice from a spiritual basis, um, from a theological grounding, we have to ask ourselves is, you know, if we're privileged, are we making space for the stories to be told? Um, and and is, if we're coming out of the Catholic social doctrine, uh, we're all brothers, fundamentally brothers and sisters, and we all work for the common good. And the common good isn't the profits of the landowner or the business owner. The common good is what are the workers who are essential to the to the profit of this person. How are they sharing in in you know in this? Now, the, of course, the risk and 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 investment is on the part of the the owner, mm -hmm. but there's also this whole thing of the the hard sweat that goes into right. this. And so that's that's the part that uh, that that. Where are we coming, having that dialogue where we're all to share together? And that's a, that's a Gene Boyle, and that's kind of where his legacy has been for me. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thanks. Now tell us a little bit. You've been telling us a little bit about you, and Gene Boyle was terribly proud of you. You know oh. that. Um, he spoke often to mm -hmm. me about you. Oh. Uh, what do you see right now um, and into the future for the Church of San Jose? 
both challenges, but also what are our strengths? Well, there's a lot of challenges everywhere, no matter where we go, but sure. I'm going to start with strengths because I think that's what we have. Mm -hmm. um, we have a strength of the diversity. We're in a great county. Um, there's an incredible amount of dedicated folks here. Um, we have a diversity that um, we're one of the most diverse counties per capita mm -hmm. uh, in, in the country. Uh, numbers will be Los Angeles County, but in terms of per capita would be uh, our place. We have the largest population of Vietnamese outside of, uh, in San Jose, outside, outside, of, of, Vietnam. outside of Vietnam. Right. Um, we have a real um, active uh, Chicano community, um, Mexica community, a Mexican. Long history. Right, a long history, um, a strong API community, Asian Pacific Islander mm -hmm. uh, folks. Um, and I think that we have um, a lot of Anglos that grew up here and then a bunch of new folks that are European Americans that have moved into the area that are appreciating the diversity mm -hmm. of this. So that diversity is, is, is really the strength. And we can make it work. We show that we have strong gun laws. We also uh, have fewer deaths. We have strong civil rights, and yet and, and we have extremely profitable businesses. Mm -hmm. um, there are challenges in our county, um, which is really regional. It's affordable housing is impossible. The challenges of the diocese is keeping our talent. Um, our lay workers. Uh, and, and includes social workers at Catholic Charities and, and any other of, the, of these smaller agencies. Mm -hmm. We, our pay is not going, is, is, isn't able to sustain and people, people living, living here. So people are living, leaving all the time and we have talented lay ministers that we simply cannot uh, uh, pay. Mm -hmm. And that's a challenge. Um, I did a, um, as part of my work at Catholic Charities, I did these uh, one-to-ones with 43 of the 50 three odd folks that are in the um, pastors in the diocese. Mm -hmm. And there's a, you know, affordable housing is a top of the list. And then, then our issue with the homelessness is another challenge. The question is, what are we going to do as a diocese? And I, I think that we are, we're struggling to figure that out. Mm -hmm. With now Catholic Charities, the, the bishop has assigned me to work at Catholic Charities. And I mm -hmm. hope that, my hope is that bringing the question of not like what can parishes do to help Catholic Charities do their job, it's basically how can Catholic Charities help parishes who are the first responders mm -hmm. do their job well. And that doesn't mean we load the pastors up with other stuff, but it's like figuring out what can we do to kind of respond to these needs if they're saying what the needs are. <clears throat> pastors are working, you know, incredible amount of hours. I was a pastor for a million years at St. Julie's and then Guadalupe. <clears throat> and you know, with more administrative kinds of things and compliance questions and then just sure. taking care of the parking lot, taking care of the roof, taking care of supervising employees to be sure that every everyone is, you know, just has the done their papers. Just the maintenance alone. The maintenance, but it's also like when you have 20-something odd people that you're, you have to be sure that did everybody sign their paper, the, the, their their paperwork right. on, on, you know, did they are go through Are we in this? compliance with are, this? Yeah, yeah. And, and so all of these things come up and there's it's and very they're time detailed. consuming too. Yeah. Right, it's kind of nine a mind numbing and then you have to deal with uh, I, I spoke to one pastor and he gets up at six in the morning and he has the early morning mass 6 30 mass and then he has it, he's in an immigrant parish and then he has a number of other kinds of things that he has to do in the daytime and because like being in an immigrant parish I understand that he has to do the uh, mass then he, after the mass he has to do consejos after the mass and then after that after that there's a funeral then after mm -hmm. that there's a break where he has to meet with staff members then there's a, a, a two-hour break where he can <clears throat> eat lunch and exercise and then get ready for the evening meetings because his dinner is basically going to the taqueria, grabbing some food, and then coming back for three other meetings that evening where he's criticized for jumping from place to place. Then he gets a call at two in the morning. Mm -hmm. the in hospital. the meantime, he's supposed to be preparing <clears throat> the Sunday homily. You know, it's right. crazy. And I, yeah. yeah, and there's, what, you, what you're doing as a pastor in some of in, in our immigrant parishes, you're preparing three homilies a day. You're preparing your daily mass homily. You're, re, you're preparing a mass for, for a funeral. Then you're preparing a, a, a you know, talk for that evening. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so you're really, you're, you're constantly on and then that, that, the preparation time. So, so you, you, there's not a break. And so what's happening is we're pushing our guys uh, really hard. So and, and right, and lay people at this point are not allowed to preach. Um, or, or not given the faculties to preach. Um, and, and if they are preaching, it's someone will report them, and then, you, you know, and, and so they there's that. more things you have to do. <clears throat> they got more things you got to complain, and, and, and so those are those pieces. So, there, yeah, there's a lot of challenges. I think that, um, you know, looking at the question of, you know, um, how do we make space for women's voices and women's leadership? 
I mean, real leadership. I mean, we're, we're talking about leadership that, that is able to make a decision about assignments, policy, a policy about who's hired, who's fired, um, uh, about um, how money is used in the parish until we can get, you know, employ or open up the possibility that 50% of the population can also contribute to the leadership of a diocese until we really get those voices there. I think that we're going to have a, a that is going to be the biggest challenge. I think the other challenge is going to be um, young people are asking all sorts of questions that we um, are not responding uh, to. Uh, what we do is our, 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 our responses are also retrieving from the past and making relevant for the future. Mm -hmm. um, now that works for a certain percentage of the young people, but for the, for the vast majority of young people, millennials and critical thinkers, um, that way of answering apologetics really can go only so far. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's sort of like uh, as pom-poms are to gymnastics, apologetics is to theology. So you can only do so, so much, much. <laughs> and pom-poms is not going to convert people and to answer the questioning mind. And when you're living in a valley where you have more doctorates, you know, people with doctorate mm -hmm. degrees, people that are inventing things, people that are working on, you know, pretty, pretty amazing big, projects, yeah. that, that it's, you know, I went to do a, a Ash Wednesday service at Facebook. Mm. Um, fascinating experience. I bet. I've been to Google, visit the Google campus, and talk to people there. Um, and there are Catholics in, in those, in those, and practicing Catholics in those companies. And I spoke, and a good friend of mine says, "Yeah, I went to Facebook to do." And he says, "Are there any? Really, are there practicing Catholics there?" Well, I found that kind of an amazing uh, question, and whether he meant that sardonically or whether he meant that in sincerity, um, it did the fact that he would even question the fact. Of course, there are because sure. you know discerning Catholics. Of, of you know uh, of a generation you know beyond me you know, mm -hmm. the, the older generation there were uh, lots of discerning and brilliant Catholics that were that were still Catholic and still Absolutely. very loyal to the Roman Catholic Church even though they may have disagreed on certain pieces mm -hmm. we need to find another way to dialogue so I think that's not just a Roman it's not a problem in our diocese mm -hmm. uh, it's a problem nationwide mm -hmm. and I think that that um, in our diocese we just need to f figure a way to how do we talk to people that are that are involved in the high-tech industry that have whose whose lives are really especially creatives are all about asking why mm -hmm. um, our we have a lot of people that are designers in our um, mm -hmm. social designers as well as product designers uh, in our in our communities and when we have inarticulate talks or half-baked ideas and you know poor planning and poor organizing uh, and uh, and their children are coming to our religious education programs and their and and our catechists don't ha you know aren't maybe necessarily prepared with all those difficult questions I think that we're gonna face that and I think we see it's really interesting that the demography is changing when I went to do the the, the, the studies of the, of the parishes, mm -hmm. um, because of high cost of housing, people are moving out That's and true. leaving seniors behind. And in, in the deanery five and deanery six, you just have people living in dense housing, three or four families in one house, yes. and they're looking to the church not for answers but for comfort and support. The people in the west side are, you know, the older folks are for nostalgia and, and emotional support and community. And uh, but where is that middle? Where is, where is a college-educated Catholic? Um, I think that we have a lot of them living in Silicon Valley, but few and fewer are uh, finding a home um, in the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. and, and so they will often turn to um, other activities, um, and and that's not it's mm -hmm. sad because there's a there's a spiritual void, mm -hmm. and I think that um, that's a big challenge that we have as a church. That how do we respond to that void? Do you have any hope? Yeah, I have a lot of hope. I, I think do. that, I, I, you know, um, uh, the bishop we have now, and uh, maybe by the time this is all edited, we'll have a different bishop, but the bishop we have now um, <clears throat> is a great convener. Mm -hmm. He's respected all across, of all ideologies and of all class lines. He's respected because he does what a bishop ought to do, which is convene yeah. and, and welcome people together and be hospitable. Mm -hmm. um, now, the challenge is that there's only so many people that can do that kind of work. Mm -hmm. My hope is that um, he's created, a, 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 he's, he seems to have created a lot of space for that uh, dialogue to happen. And he's um, allowed a lot of people to kind of ask 
you know, challenging questions. Mm -hmm. And I see that um, that the diocese is also a place that is um, very welcoming of LGBTQ people. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, put our put ourselves out on the line to help and support immigrants. Um, it could have easily, he could have, uh, the Catholics that were conservative could have easily put the kibosh on the work that we we're doing with creating the most, um, one of the most progressive detainer policies mm -hmm. in the United States here in Santa Clara County. Santa Clara County, with the urging and support of the church, has um, been able to get almost a billion dollars in money for affordable housing. Mm -hmm. We have uh, sued the Trump administration um, city of San Jose and the county, mm -hmm. um, again with the support and the consultation of faith leaders to make this happen. I see there's a, an immense amount of goodwill and support of the general population for the Roman Catholic Church. There is no hatred, there is no animosity. Um, there, there, it's, it's open and fertile ground. The question, the question lies is the next generation of Catholics is not going to, the leadership may not be from ordained clergy, but will we make the space for women and will we make the space for millennial Catholics to, to make the change? Um, as we're taping this interview um, tomorrow, um, teenagers are leading the nation yes. in reforming gun control. Um, and to say that uh, these are tomorrow's leaders, they're not tomorrow's leaders, they're today's leaders. Right. Um, to have, what if we had that kind of enthusiasm and that kind of support for young people who are asking questions of, of, of their faith? Mm -hmm. That would be the leadership I would, I would be hopeful. We have that kind of leadership at MIDI. We have that kind of leadership at Prospect High School. We have that kind of leadership at Independence and, mm -hmm. and Overfelt and Cristo Rey. We have that leadership in our own diocese. Mm -hmm. uh, where will we, what will we do to step back? And, and allow that to happen. I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm excited that we can. Exactly. Yeah, so I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens. I think this is a great note for us to finish our well, conversation. Yes, I, I loved so. it. It's been so fun being with Thanks, you. Thanks, Ian. Thank you. <laughs>